What exactly is the Colorado River Compact? Let's do a deep dive. In the U.S. Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, Clause number three says that Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. Here we're talking about among the several states. The intent from the beginning was for the federal government to mediate all affairs involving the state's relationship with each other. This was to keep individual states from negotiating treaties with other nations and trying to bar each other from moving goods and services around the country and around the world. This authority was later clarified and expanded by the 1887 Interstate Commerce Act. This law clarified that the original Commerce Clause also applied to things like individual industries, specifically the fees that railroads were charging. The issue of who owns rivers has always been hotly contested. In the U.S., it's been settled law for quite some time that the federal government has authority over any water that is navigable. Basically, anything that's deep enough to take a commercial boat on. In the case of the Colorado River Compact, it really was a very unique moment in time. Unlike the Ohio River or the Mississippi River or any of the rivers back east, there wasn't a lot of existing commerce that needed to be taken into account. While there are many indigenous peoples who had used the Colorado River for centuries, it was very insensitively thought that the river was just up for grabs. In the early part of the 20th century, none of the bordering states or territories had the resources to take the river on their own. But in that weird period of time between the two world wars, everyone could sense that a metaphorical gold rush was brewing. This is how the interstate treaty started. And who was it that stepped up in this auspicious moment of history? None other than future president and California native, Herbert Hoover. Hoover was sent by President Wilson to try and negotiate this new agreement. But it was pretty clear from the start that his California loyalties were very much at play. He wanted the Imperial Valley to be developed. They already had settlers there. They had already attempted to grow crops. It had been very successful and a disaster all in the span of a few years. And he definitely wanted to see the river get developed to protect the Southern California interests. And the other states saw right through him. The first meeting of the state representatives was a disaster. Arguments, fights, condescending speech making. Basically, everybody walked away from that meeting angry. But everyone came back to the table because of some pretty harsh realities. You see, without a written compact in place, every state was vulnerable. For example, California could build its own dam, build its own canal, put in all the infrastructure it wanted to to protect its interests in the Imperial Valley. And there'd be nothing to stop Utah from coming along and building a diversion and hijacking all that water. Also, since the river forms the border between several of these states, there'd be nothing to stop the state on the other side from sabotaging the work that the other state was doing. As chaotic as things are today with the Colorado Compact, the consequences of not having this agreement in place would have been far worse. Stick around for the next video and we'll talk about what the compact actually says.